So, Nick, uh, I recently, just this week, came across a really interesting paper that you've written, I think, about a year ago. I only just got my hands on it, called Reflections on the Economics of Socialism. Can you tell us a little bit about this paper and how it came about? OK, uh, it came out about a year ago, you're right. I actually completed it in September of the year before, so about 18 months ago. I was asked to guest edit a special issue of a journal, the Journal of Global Fault Lines, which I'd contributed an article to like four years, three or four years before that, which got some interest going. That was about um, what I see as Lenin's misreading of an aspect of Marx's critique of the Goethe program. That was about the difference between socialism and communism and all of that. So I was asked to do a follow-up and I decided that it would be good to look at how socialism might work. As it happens, most of the contributions weren't really around that. Andrew Kleiman contributed a really good piece on the critique of the Goethe program and various misinterpretations. And there were other, uh, Noah Tucker contributed something about uh, economic planning in the Soviet Union. But uh, my piece was focused precisely on what I wanted the journal to deal to deal with. So I'm delighted that uh, you've read that and you think it's of in interest. Uh, so that's how it came about. Shall I say a little bit about what's in it? Why not? So there's sort of um, two main things, I think. Well, three themes, really. One is that I'm arguing that we need to envisage a form of future society in which the market is superseded. I don't think the market's going to be abolished overnight, but uh, I think there's lots of issues with models of market so socialism. Perhaps we can discuss that. So I'm looking for a form of non-commodity, cooperative, democratic, participatory so socialism and asking the question, what form of economics could support that? I'm against the concept of centralised, top-down planning, command economics, if you like, primarily because I think that it doesn't allow for ordinary mortals to actually participate in the running of the society. So I think you need as much decentralization as possible so that decisions are taken as close to the communities and individuals which they impact. So uh, I think you need a decentralized form of economy. How do you do that without the market? Because traditionally, and Alec Nove, I looked, I was looking particularly back to Alec Nove's book from the early 1980s on feasible so socialism, in which uh, he also made the he made the case against command economics. But his only answer of a feasible form of so socialism was to introduce uh, uh, the market to a large extent and have competing profit maximizing economic units essentially, whether they're owned by the state or their cooperatives or small private sector and so on. That was the form of economy which he said was the only viable way of uh, reaching beyond capitalism. I think it fails to do that. But I think you can have forms of horizontal coordination and decentralization and flexibility and responsiveness in the a so socialist economy, which aren't mediated by market forms. And that's the argument that I make. And I, I call this goal-directed economic coordination. So uh, I think that socialist economic planning should be reconceptualized in these terms. That's the debate I'm happy to have with whoever is interested in these ideas. I suppose maybe we'll hit into some of these arguments because it was okay. quite interesting in the paper. You, in that book, the uh, feasible as feasible socialism by Noel, yeah. I think eighty three book or something like that. Yeah. It's actually quite quite good in play. It's actually quite a good book, even though I think there's a lot wrong in it. But he he, he positions this kind of key 
problem, this kind of dichotomy between ex-ante and ex-post planning. Do you want to talk a little bit around that and, and your opinions around this dichotomy? Yes, I think it's a false dichotomy, if you like, but it's accepted by an awful lot of people, both those who support Alec Nove and those like Ernest Mandel who opposed him. They accept this dichotomy. Alec Nove says the only alternative to vertical subordination, command economics, central planning, is horizontal links. And I kind of agree with him on that. But he then goes on to say, but horizontal links, that is between producers and between them and consumers, either directly or via wholesaling agencies, equal production for exchange, which again is some species of the market. So that sec second part is what I disagree with and I seek to challenge. So Alec Nove places the argument that central planning is about deciding ex ante, using a lat Latin term, i.e. before production, what you're going to produce and also who's going to receive it and so on and uh, what all the interlink economic interlinkages to facilitate the distribution are. And ex post, which is how he characterizes economic decision making in a market where you produce for anonymous consumers and then you wait to see what's purchased and what is not. And you have uh, uh, supply and demand. So the price of things goes up and down. If you've su successfully matched your production to market demand, then uh, as we all know, the you'll get the value of the goods that you've produced back and the price may go up you may get more than that if no one else is producing that and so the market provides feedback signals to producers on whether they should continue that line of production or whether they should produce other things or get out of that uh, productive field altogether and invest elsewhere so it's ex post lots of feedback or ex ante, you decide in advance exactly what you're going to produce and uh, all the consumers, whether they're other productive units or individual consumers consuming consumer goods, uh, just have to lump what's produced and sort of scrabble around uh, that. So that's the ex ante, ex post dichotomy. Ernest Mandel actually accepts that framework for the argument which he makes and lots of other people who argue for economic socialist planning that does does involve the market, the majority, but almost everyone, apart from a, a handful, accept that division as well. But I'm rejecting that on the basis that there is no organisation of any sort which doesn't respond to feedback, and that whether it's the NHS or nationalised electricity companies they have to cater for what uh, what demand is actually there. They have to build in uh, some excess capacity, but also uh, change uh, sort of sort of uh, uh, over the course of a production cycle or year, say, they have to uh, change what they're doing, what activity they engage in. That's obvious with the National Health Service. They don't plan in advance exactly how many operations of what type they're going to uh, carry out. They didn't respond to COVID by saying, uh, uh, well, we've, that's not in our plan. We can't do anything for for you. So you have to be able to, an organisation like the National Health Service in this country has to be able to respond flexibly. And uh, I see no reason why, even if it's a cent centralised economic units, cannot respond flexibly as well. My argument is that this kind of flexible, goal-directed economic coordination would allow you to maximise the amount of decentralisation or subsidiarity, as it's sometimes called, as well, so that you could have uh, local communities could make their own decisions about what activities they're going to engage in, uh, and you have a central authority which coordinates that. Even capitalist firms aren't just purely reactive. They plan in advance and then they facilitate really? dynamics in the market. Yes. And even central planning 
in actuality, they had plans, but the plans themselves were constantly changing. No five-year plan remained the same plan over five years. Absolutely. And even those were broken down into one-year operational plans, which is what Alec Nove describes. Even those would change, but they weren't particularly good at allocating the additional labour resources or other inputs that would be needed to accommodate the changes in the plan. So they didn't do that particularly well. But what happened was that um, economic production units would make links with other enterprises and source what they required from there. And you had people who, for a fee, were able to put one set of suppliers in touch with another. So even in the Soviet Union, you're absolutely correct. They, they This, this flex, flexibility had to be part of how they managed to uh, keep the economy going on any basis at all. But you're absolutely right. Ex ante doesn't really work even for describing everything as ex post in a capitalist economy is false as well, because everything that is produced, you can only produce something if you plan to do it in advance. What you don't generally have is uh, it's not socially regulated or planned ex ante it's individual production units have to plan in advance what they're going to produce and uh, even if you're an individual trader producer or whatever like a black blacksmith if those still exist or used to <laughs> at the beginning of the day the blacksmith has to plan what uh, he or she is going to uh, do that's the nature of human work that it's planned it's planned it's just in capitalism it tends that planning tends to be fragmented and where so socialism can uh, actually transform things is by having coordinating those activities and and overcoming that fragmentation which means that one production unit doesn't necessarily have a clue what another production unit is going to do like it's it's very interesting like this gets to the very heart of the nature by actually what do people mean by planning you yeah. know when when marx and engels you know and their various you know i've done a big haul through all the the, <laughs> the the works that they've done and they only talk about planning in about 30 or 40 places yeah and nearly always it's to do with the anarchy of the market where yes. they and they link it to they link it to the cartels and they say that production within the cartel is already planned because they don't have the anarchy of the market within that commodity yeah. of whatever commodity it is. So it's like this notion that planning has then got to do another jump up to this other level of like centralized at the state level, all in one plan. Like yeah. that doesn't really exist in Marx or Engels at all, bar yeah. um, maybe one quote by Engels, which I think can be read in the in the in the way that you talk about it here as mm. in like the level at which it re is needs to be done should be done centrally. sometimes there, there is a mention of a single plan mark says somewhere in the first volume of capital i think mentions a single plan yeah but i think that's angles that... i think that's angles in the social okay. in the utopian socialism utopian okay. and that. That's i think it's in there. there yeah yeah but i mean we're we're trying to uh we have to work out these things by ourselves. And there's a contradiction between the concept of centralizing all economic decisions, ending up with a GOS plan analog, deciding everything that's going to be produced down to the smallest widget or screw for a whole year. There's a difference between that. There's a conflict between that and Marx's idea in the civil war in France, when he's talking about the commune, uh, the kind of political structure which he describes there, he does talk about the the communes across France would have come together and formed a central committee, but explicitly doesn't say that that would have taken all the decisions for the whole society and the whole economy. His discussion of how the Paris Commune went halfway to abolishing the state does not imply implies the inverse of that that uh, communities and communes would have had uh, wide ranging decision making authority uh, at the lowest level 
you mentioned in here some talk about pull systems of of ways of organizing economic functions as opposed to i think push systems so yeah. this would be pull is just in time lean manufacturing yeah. systems as opposed to this block at the start of the year here is your production quota and you have to follow that and it's pushed out into the system do you want to talk a little bit about what role you think this plays in the uh, in a socialist economy okay well I don't think any economy can work entirely on a push basis, as I've said. There's various suggestions, like Mandel suggests that you can have a poll, that you can uh, do polling of all consumers and they can say before the year begins, the production year begins, uh, what they're going to want over the next year. And some of what uh, Albert and Hanel say in uh, the books they've written uh, about power cons suggests the same thing that you have negotiations between workers councils and consumer councils and that uh, you end up with an economic plan that describes everything that every individual is going to want for the rest of the year but i i just don't that doesn't seem a plausible way of organizing an economy that we could go to anyone at all and say this is what we're proposing uh, we're going to still presumably have restaurants or canteens or whatever we're not going to be able to ask people at the beginning of the year what they're going to want to eat on uh, in uh, in each uh, which days they're going to want to go to a restaurant to what time uh, and what they're going to uh, eat sometimes when you have a christmas party you're asked in advance which meal you're going to have or wed wedding or whatever. So there is some space for sort of uh, giving notice for what you're going to have. But I, I don't think it's uh, it, it's anyone's going to buy the idea of doing that a whole year in advance or even uh, in, on the majority of occasions, any time in advance at all. So you need to be able to respond flexibly to uh, actually people will go to a pub and order uh, however many pints of beer they want so uh, a pub's gonna just have to have to be able to say okay uh we've uh, offloaded a certain amount of beer this week we're going to have to order more next next week and the economy is going to have to be able to respond to that so that's pull where people are actually responding to that people marxists have always argued that trends in the capitalist economy are indicative of the socialist future to some extent or another. So the point that you mentioned before, that um, the area within which conscious planning takes place, even in a capitalist economy, expands and get big, it gets bigger as firms become larger and more international and more vertically linked. They actually make decisions within those firms that are are not mitigated by the market they'll be responding to ultimately they'll be responding to the market but the decisions they make about what they're going to produce where they're going to get their inputs from and all of this are going to be conscious decisions which they make but some of the more recent trends in uh, capitalist economics have been towards things like just in time production and so on instead of stockpiling everything they need in a warehouse or whatever they have economic links which allow them to uh, uh, get their inputs and supplies when they need those so there's um, amazon for instance doesn't stockpile all the books they think they might sell over the next year they you've got print on demand now so um, uh, and you've had that for a long uh, time so they they just print off the books that people actually want. And and, uh, it just seems inconceivable to me that a a socialist economy would not adopt the same approach. So we just have to work out how we consciously coordinate that and how we don't just have pull. So we're not creating a consumer market and just responding to a consumer market. We've got lots of imperatives in a socialist economy are completely different from the uh, uh, motivations and imperatives of a capitalist economy, transformatively different as far as I'm concerned. So you've got lots of socially determined goals, which some will be made centrally. Some of those 
goal making decisions would be made would be decentralized as well but but they create a framework within which uh, production takes place so it's economic coordination of those pull mechanisms if you like which are driven by socially determined goals whether those relate to the economy to social goals around uh, greater egalitarianism and uh, production for need and so on so i think a so- socialist economy is completely different from a capitalist one but we're not going to uh, we it's going to be constructed on the basis of what the uh, economic resources and the economic techniques which we inherit. So I don't think we're going to discard all those techniques which we've been discussing, just just in time production and and continuous replenishment and all of that kind of thing. So actually Phillips and Rozwalski discussed that in the People's Republic of Walmart, which um, I think is a very useful discussion which they have there. I've had much the same idea. I I was reading something I wrote back in 1998. So I haven't. So and I was making much the same point then that I'm making this article. So it's always seemed to me that that's the obvious way that you would organise things. The the lean kind of revolution. I'm just reading a book about it at the moment. A book called The Toyota Way. Uh, it's a very interesting book. I think. You'd really like it, uh, Nick, okay. to read it. It's just about the uh, kind of the Toyota production system was the first one to introduce these lean techniques. Yeah. It's it's been so. It's to the extent that this whole way of operating the economy has come to really dominate in large sectors over this push, and it, it it seems that it's quite likely as to want to go back to push is like wanting to go back to handicraft. You know, it's 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 these are stages in capitalist economic development from machinery or manufacture machinery, mass production and and now lean production, this Toyota philosophy. Absolutely. Since I published this a year ago, I've not had uh, that many positive responses, to be honest. So I think it's actually I find it quite bizarre the way that people I've discussed this with cannot conceive of the idea that a socialist economy can uh, encapsulate this kind of flexibility even as simple as say you're producing a line of t-shirts which are either red or blue even if you decide at the beginning of the year how many t-shirts you're going to produce would you decide how many red or blue ones you're going to produce it seems obviously not but i've had it argued to me by a prominent economist that it's not feasible not to decide in advance how many red and blue t-shirts you're going to produce and that uh, because there's so many uh, other variables are dependent on that you've got to get blue dye or red dye and then you might have to get the red dye from one mine or wherever you get dye from and uh, the blue dye from another and so on so it's the argument is it's completely impractical to do that in a socialist planned economy but if you say that you're as far as I'm concerned, you're basically saying a consciously planned socialist economy is not viable. And I, I refuse to believe that because uh, I think it's imperative. Way well, it's imperative that we um, move towards a completely different way of running the economy. I just think all the trends and tendencies within capitalism point towards a different type of economy. But we're not. But we're not going to go back, as you say, to some archaic form of capitalist production or any archaic form of production that precedes capitalism altogether. And people are going to be happy with that. You're just yeah. going to have riots. It's kind of uh, for people that would would accuse Proudhon of wanting to go back to you know artisan production. As being yeah. like a non-material utopianism, this is just another version of utopian science yeah. socialist utopianism, as far as yeah. I can see. Um, yeah. Do you want to discuss then a little bit about uh, subsidiarity and how you think this plays into all this idea of dynamics and planning, and what it is, what even it is for the uninitiated, what is subsidiarity? So subsidiarity is just a fancy term, really, for decentralization. 
but within it it's sort of they discussed it in terms of the european union which uh, i'm not sure we can mention that now in this country but uh, in terms the advocates of the european union said okay we're going to have federalism but we're not going to centralize all decision making at a european le level we'll decentralize to the lowest possible level so it's the principle that decisions should be taken at the lowest possible level that's compatible with uh, the kind of political economy you want to have. So some decisions obviously have to be make and made at a global level, say the challenge we face uh, in terms of the various climate crises, whether it's global warming or what appears to be rapid destruction of biodiversity. Dealing with those requires decisions both at a global level, at continental levels, at what are now national levels and regional levels and local lev levels. So you need to work out which decisions need, need to be made at what level and so on. But essentially, I think that socialism, my concept of socialism, and I think this was the concept of Marx and Engels, is that as soon as the workers take control of society, the institution of the state begins to wear through a way. It's not something that happens in the far distant future. And this was the uh, import of the article I wrote about five years ago now. And um, that Lenin, by arguing that in what Marx called the lower phase, the lowest, the first phase of communism, that Lenny described as so, so socialism, you would retain a strong state. I don't think that was Marx and Engels' conception of how the pol politics would, would work. I think they see the commune state, which Lenny, by the way, in State and Revolution, where he made this argument, is lots of good stuff in State and Revolution, actually advocated at that point for a, a commune state. Marx and Engels saw that as halfway to get, getting rid of the state altogether. But I don't think you can have a, a political construction where you don't have a central institution that's autonomous from society and separate from the people over which it rules. I think you abolish that. But Marx still, you still need political institutions, you need institutions to manage things, but that they have to be accountable to people. And the only way you can achieve that, I argue, is by making it them accountable, give people in each community, whether it's a street or a village or town or district, give them as much authority and responsibility and accountability as possible. So as many of the decisions you, you need are being made by councils at a local level, but that uh, you still need centralised bodies to coordinate stuff. So subsidiarity is not an absolutely anarchist idea that everyone just makes decisions. Uh, that may be uh, uh, maligning what an anarchists actually believe, but um, if the idea that you don't dictate in any uh, way at all to the organisations, the institutions that exist in local communities at the lowest le level is in practice practical i think you, the, you and it's not desirable because as i was arguing you do need to make decisions at higher levels and i have to emphasize i'm not arguing in this paper for a model as such i'm putting forward arguments and themes and saying that as socialists if we want to advocate for an alternative to cap capitalism it's insufficient to put forward some sort of generic construction like is often said like a central a central plan under workers control or whatever you actually need to spell out how things are going to work but the broad principles which are going to inform those but i wouldn't i'm not seeking to impose on future generations or the citizens of a future society how they organize things i'm saying it's possible i'm arguing that it's possible to conceive of a society of a so so socialist economy 
that would be flexible and responsive and would overcome the issues around misallocation of resources and huge differences in levels of development around the world and the environmental crises, plus would deal with the fact that workers are exploited and alienated and lots of workers basically hate the work that they do. So I think our ambition should be to uh, completely overcome overcome that and create useful, enjoyable work that um, people actually enjoy doing. That work, if you look it, to quote someone, uh, becomes becomes like life's it. prime want. Yeah. No, it, it seems that when, you know, uh, myself and Donald are writing a book on this whole area and, you know, when you dive into the literature, if you're as unfortunate as probably you or my, myself and Donald <laughs> haven't read it, there's very little about in the literature, I feel like, about what we're really trying to do, which is yeah. get rid of alienated labor and exploitation. Yeah. And so much of it seems to center on that the essence of socialism is a central plan and the essence of like capitalism is the market. Well, yes. the market is an epiphenomenon of exploitation yeah. and alienated labor. Absolutely. And, and on these arguments, it's it is like overwhelmingly it's missing the wood for the trees. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it all becomes a technical kind of exercise, which is not going to excite anyone at all. And it's not dealing <laughs> with the main I mean, you and I and Don or it excites us a bit, but uh, uh, most people are not in, interested in this at all, as I can tell from the general response to what to what I wrote. So I'm, as I said before, I'm delighted that uh, that you've dis discovered it and are interested in the ideas in there. But you're absolutely correct that the key thing is not technology or use values or economic mechanisms. It's the relationships that human beings have with other human beings, which completely distorted and commodified and alienated under the social system we live in now. It's unnatural. It's inhuman for us to be so atomized and individualized and just competing against each other rather than living in a fulfilling, sustaining communities and and sort of helping each other basically which um, if you there's so many people who get involved in some voluntary work of some sort or another the local pub where two minutes from where i live is a community owned pub and there's so many individuals who are prepared to get involved in managing that and doing voluntary work around that and so on so the idea that people are just just want to sit at home in this atomized existence that lots of us that sort of does actually happen i think people have an, a hunger to escape from that and and that's that's what socialism should be providing an alternative to and that i'm sort of a william morris vision of what the alternative is who's this william morris again <laughs> He was the one who did, he was a 19th century figure who made his name first as uh, being in the sort of arts and craft movement, sort of associated with the pre-Raphaelites, if you like. His wife was uh, the lover of one of the pre-Raphaelites and he produced lots of wallpaper. He's probably more famous for wallpaper now than any, any, anything else. But he became a so socialist and he actually, it was the Democratic League initially. And he was in the same political organisation as Hindman. And then uh, he split with Hindman, so in the 1880s. So all these political splits among socialists and Marxists, as they both identified as Marx, Marxists, has been going on since the year dot. And Eleanor Marx, if I remember correctly, was closer to William was in William Morris's organization, at least initially, rather than Heinemann's organization. Both Engels and Eleanor Markston didn't get on with Heinemann at all. They always saw him as a sectarian and dogmatic and so on. And William Morris, E.P. Thompson wrote 
one of his first books was a great big massive biography of William Morris. So, and so it, his socialism is more sort of, and he wrote News from Nowhere, which is one of, which is a novel, which actually describes a socialist society of the future. So he had this idea that it's not just about industrial production, but that it's about so socialism should be about restoring elements of craft production as well and making work something that people actually want to do. Yeah. I don't necessarily go, I'm not, not saying we should all read News of Nowhere and that's the model of a future society. But I do think there's uh, we can learn a lot from uh, that. Yeah, because he has a, there's a house of his that's near where I'm living here in Woolwich in Bexley okay. Heath. That's like a national trust house. And Is that Chelmsford House or something? It's called Red House. Red House, okay. In Bexley Heath. And my partner was trying to get me to go to it about five years ago, and it was about she sold it as some guy who did wallpaper, and it didn't it didn't pass her <laughs> pass the test. Me, so I was like, "No, you're all right. You can head off on your own." So I must say, uh, go there sometime because it's actually only about a mile or two away from yeah. here. There's like, a William Morris Museum quite close to me as well in Walth Walthamstow. So that I've not been to that for a few years. So like you, I should head on down. I have a question for you then, Nick. Have you further developed any ideas since writing the paper a few years ago? Or have you been reading anything that's caught your eye or anything like that? Well, the Paracom people, uh, Rob, Rob and Hanel was in London in June of last year. He got in touch with me and I met, met up with him and some of his people. He was doing some workshops and so on. So, uh, I engaged with the Paracon idea, participatory economics ideas of Michael Albert and Robin Hanel, and I read a couple of the recent books which he's written. I've engaged with some of that. I've also, but I've actually, there's a different project I've been doing recently around imperialism and so on. But I have been looking. I've also been thinking about the Chinese example and so on, which um, some of the folk I know argue is the viable form of socialism now and for the future 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 and as you can guess i don't accept that in any shape or form so um so uh, you're trying I'm to looking at the polit tell political me. economy of china of china and how that fits into the political economy of global capitalism are you trying to tell me now nick that you think that socialism won't won't have billionaires won't um, have billionaires won't have one of the highest levels of inequality in the world and won't have even the state firms with shares and competing against each other and going around investing around the world and buying up mines and all that kind of thing. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Or Chinese state banks going around the world and lending money and all this kind of thing. Where are these dynamics that will force such a system back towards communism? You know, I, I mean, think it will be the working class. I mean, uh, it has to come out of the working class. It's it not has going to come out of the out working views. class. So, what I don't describe in my paper or discussing my paper is how you get to the kind of economy whose principles I'm describing in there. So, I, I think you have to have a discussion about what we're aiming for before we um, uh, have the discussion about how we get there. But nevertheless, there's certain key principles I've always held, which is that it's uh, the reason why capitalism creates the potential for a form of cooperative, democratic, participatory society is because it creates a um, dispossessed class in the work, working class that actually produces all the value, does all the work, and um, it realises its own strength. It can, uh, with a click of the fingers almost, take control of society. So the question is how, A, how you organise to achieve that, and B, what that political act of the working class, the sort of uh, a victory of democracy, as Marx put it in, uh, in the Communist Manifesto, or the sort of seizure of political power by the work, working class, what that consists of and how a democratic form of worker state what that is because that's i don't think that's actually people have a very good handle 
on that you've got some ideas around what happened in Russia in 1917 and the creation of Soviets and so on. I do think that councils of different kinds and people beginning to run things for themselves is it will be a key component of that, which is why I think trying to impose on that an economy in which you effectively suck all power away from those councils and give it to some same central authority is an undesirable thing and ought to be resisted. We haven't mentioned anything to do with uh, labour tokens, socialism as a, as a labour accounting economy. What are your thoughts on this and how this plays in with your thoughts of dynamics, et cetera, et cetera? Well, if you're going to move beyond a market economy and commodity production, so you've not got unconnected anonymous producers producing for an anonymous consumer market. So if you're not going to have commodity production of goods, you can't very well continue to have the commodity of money as it exists now. So my concept of society, and, and I would hope general so socialist concept of society is of a cooperative society in which people, which you're producing for need, you have consumption by production units, you have consumption by uh, things like schools and health and so on. But how do you, uh, if you don't have mon money as it exists now, what is it, what mediates those relations? How, how do you decide, how do you allocate budgets to local authorities, if you like, or counts, counts of different sorts? How do you tell people give information to individuals about what they how much they can consume and i i i think that we ought to take seriously marx's idea that labor that labor accounting is the form that that should take so that individuals in return for the work that they do or if they can't work they also receive labor certificates or tokens that so a balance is kept between the uh, uh, number of tokens issued and the amount of work that is done. So I, I think the labor theory, Marx's labor theory of value, holds as far as a capitalist economy is concerned. It tells us uh, deep, profound truths about the trajectory of capitalist economies, but that. All e economies are essentially about how you distribute the work that human beings do so that uh, if you can work out how much work has been done to produce the uh, use values that you produce, then and allocate a figure in labour hours or minutes or seconds or whatever to that use value and then you uh, provide labour tokens to individuals in that society then you can uh, well to production units but also to individuals as far as the consumer goods are concerned then you can get a match between the uh, quantity of consumer goods you produce and uh, what the ability people have to consume that it does impose so i'm assuming that there's a constraint on what individuals consume i'm not buying the argument that anytime soon if ever human ingenuity is going to uh, be able to produce as much of anything as anyone can ever conceivably want uh, with uh, minimal labour, if any labour, so that we don't need to work uh, and with no uh, uh, impact on the environment or the resources that, that we have. There is a strain of thinking in socialism which sort of gets over the kind of economic issues and problems which we've been discussing by saying, well, we don't have to be concerned about that. We don't have to make work. We don't have to worry about making enjoyable, fulfilling, sustaining work because in the future, no one's going to have to work. You can do whatever you want, mate. So are you are you, are you ruling out, Nick, then uh, the, the chance of the Star Trek replicator? Is this what you're saying? Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, no. In the paper, you, yeah. there was a couple of yes, times. Yes, that, 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 that's 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 an argument which is seriously put forward. That and there is a logic to that. Jeremy Rifkin, who's not a socialist at all, United States writer. I quote him in the paper. Uh, wrote a book 
the Zero Marginal Cost Society, I've got it somewhere, which Paul Mason stole from in order to write his post-capitalism book, hardly referencing him at all. But uh, it's Jeremy Rifkin who made the argument first that given electronic, you can produce multiples of electronic goods with no X. Once you produce one PDF, it doesn't really cost anything to distribute. Once you've distributed one, you can distribute a million with no extra cost kind of thing. So there's zero marginal cost. In fact, there's not actually zero marginal cost for society as a whole, because as we know, activity on the Internet, at least now, requires the construction of serve serve for farms and those consume lots of energy and so so on so it's not quite absolutely correct to say there's zero marginal cost but you can see the logic of electronic products and their distribution the production of one or a billion and distribution there's not really any much in the way of extra labor involved in that jeremy rifkin makes the argument that the production of energy and material goods and so on and education and health he's discussing over the next few decades that that tendency towards zero marginal costs will spread to the whole economy and no work will be required at all i have my doubts about that it doesn't even seem particularly desirable to me because i don't want i i think education where all the kids or adults who are learning are just sitting in front of a YouTube video or whatever is just taking the individualization and atomization of capitalist society and magnifying that to the nth degree. So while I support selecting those elements of development within capitalism that are useful to humanity and useful to a socialist society, there's some which I don't think are and sort of Breaking the link between human beings and community and so on, I think, is a very unuseful tendency within capitalist society that I think we ought to resist in the here and now. And we shouldn't envisage sort of uh, that's a key part of how so socialism is going to work and how we resolve all the questions we're asked about how you're going to plan to produce what goods. We'll just say, well, it does, doesn't matter. We're whatever we want, we can just produce like that with 3D printer will be producing it kind of thing it's interesting getting back to the the labor tokens uh oh, that yeah, we were we've talking got about away from that, haven't we we have we drifted uh all the star trek to blame and um, no I, I i did in the paper you did a, give a critique of what you call sci-fi socialism which is like yeah. the books Aaron bastani and paul mason and yeah. i think it's yeah. you know it's completely, completely correct. I recommend people having checking it out if they want to to read you, eviscerating it. But it's interesting though when we get to the labor tokens part, where there's an there's a part in the Gotha critique of the Gotha program where Marx says like that you know goods are no more exchanged like than I I, I can't remember exactly what he yeah. says that when you're when you're consuming with a labor token, it's not exchange right? It's not a market exchange. There's no exploitation at the base. There's no surplus value being created. There's no profits going to the capitalist class or whatever. So it, we see in that that Marx is not against dynamism, right? That when he oh, says yeah. about, he's against market exchange, he's about what market exchange is, like what capitalist market exchange is, as opposed to people like buying an ice cream and it's a sunny day sorry guys we can't produce more ice cream it's a sunny it's a very hot summer this year we got to do what the plan says it's like <laughs> i don't think you can read that anywhere into marx he he, he says the opposite and it, this misnomer has seems to be tied more to the historical development of attempts at socialism where the state was used to gain control of the productive apparatus more than anything else I, I I I agree. The critique of the Goethe program is completely misread time and time again. So he talks about labour in the communist society, it's a cooperative society, all the means of production are held in common, everyone's a worker, so there's no capitalist, there's no petty bourgeoisie for that, that matter in the society that he's describing there. There's no therefore no classes. He says labour is no longer indirect. It's direct. So all economic operations are transparent and open. There's sort of there's no different enterprises aren't keeping secrets from other enterprises. Everyone 
that's a key part of what I'm proposing, even though it's flexible and so on. Everyone's plans are published and so on. So whether you it's the central coordinating authority or or another local council, it's uh, they're all aware of what everyone else is doing and can therefore adjust their plans in light of that, unlike the fragmented economic decision making which takes place in capitalism. The key thing about labour certificates, which Marx is talking about allocating them for uh, the distribution of consumer goods, is that they aren't exchanged. So they're two, the, the person who receives them gets to spend them, or you'd have to presume their family or whatever household they're part of could spend those labour tokens. But that once they're spent, they're destroyed. So it's not like mon- money now, which goes from one hand to another. And therefore, the um, so they can't be accumulated. It's not a way of storing wealth. To that extent, all consumption is immediate consumption, if you like. It's society as a whole that plans for the future and builds up reserve funds and all of that. Uh, you don't plan your pension by sort of uh, saving lots of labor tokens to be spent in the fu- future. That's something that society will determine, if you like. And um, they're time limited, I would argue. Marx doesn't explicitly say that anywhere because he doesn't actually mention labor certificates all that often. There's three or four places in the first volume of Capital where they're mentioned. There's the critique of the Goethe program. And there's one mentioned in the second volume of Capital as well. He doesn't actually say, he said you might as well use labour certificates to do it. So he's not seeking to dictate to a future society how they organise things. But he's saying, and he attributes this to Rob Owen. And in the first volume of Capital, he explicitly says several times, it's not money. They aren't exchanged. So you've got, and they're, for the current production cycle. So they're time limited, I, I, you, I think you have to assume. And that's what uh, Paul Cockshot in his 19, 1993 book, Cockshot and Cottrell, made they advocate labour certificates. And they actually put forward using the pre-internet technology of that time, they uh, describe a way in which you could quite easily calculate how much labour had gone into the production of every commod, every uh, use value, if you like, the products which the society produces. So I think you need to be, you need to have an idea of how much labour is going into producing things in order to be able to apply a labour hours or the amount of time that's gone into producing them. Right. There's a quote, Marx says that, you know, accounting becomes even more important in under socialism than it is in capitalism. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Nick, is there anything else then that you'd like to chat about before we go or that we haven't covered? I would just emphasize that I think we need to, as we've been discussing, the key thing is so socialism from a, a human centered perspective, if you like. So it's all about creating new relations between human beings it's not creating new human beings if you like i think the new man as as people in the soviet union and so on used to talk about sort of we can only have a new society when everyone when future genera the current generation have all died and they're replaced <laughs> by a future generation which is created in a completely different Im- image has a completely different uh, sort of set of motivations and all of that i think we need to be talking about a society we create for those of us who are alive now so i I, th- I think the form of society needs to not be one that's we'll say well we'll have the revolution now but we're not going to create the society we're talking about for 100 years or two 200 years it needs to be a form of society we can create within the lifetime of individuals who are alive now. So uh, that's that's our key task in terms of envisaging what form that society would, would take. Well, Nick, thanks very much for coming on the show today. Thanks very much, Tom. That was great. I enjoyed our, our talk, our discussion. 